قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh And welcome to this live episode of Ask Zad Coming to you every Saturday between Maghrib and Isha in Mecca region As usual we'll take three uh, questions from the emails and then we will take most of your questions from your phone calls and zoom and answer it afterwards because we have a technical problem with zoom so do bear with us sara says is it permissible to give zakat to charity organizations that get relief funds where they provide calamity stricken people with food or clothes this is an issue of dispute. The default is that we must give the poor zakat money in cash. And they decide whether they want to buy medicine or pay their rent or pay their bills or buy food. This is up to them, not to our preference. It's not for us to have the zakat money and say, okay, this poor fam family needs clothes. We'll buy them clothes. Maybe they need something else. So it's not my preference. The default is I have to give it to them in cash. However, some scholars like Sheikh bin Baz, may Allah have mercy on his soul, say that it is permissible to give them items that are not cash, such as food or clothes. And it seems to me, and Allah knows best, and this is my own opinion, that giving it to charity organizations as zakat that we trust and we know that they'll buy food, clothes, and whatever the poor and uh, uh, calamity struck areas people need, and they're Muslims and they're deserving, if we trust them, I believe that this is permissible because it is not feasible nor practical to go to such areas that was uh, uh, for example, flooded with floods and give them cash money to go and buy, buy food. For them, that would be more burdensome to know where to get the food and they'll get it with much higher prices. So the vast majority of them would authorize these charity organizations to just get us anything, food, water, clothes, shelter, whatever. We, we need all of this. And you have full authority to do that. And by doing this, they can buy it uh, uh, as a wholesale cheaper. And they can provide this service to the needy and the poor in a better convenient way. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Um, a questioner says, I reside in India. If the restaurant owner is Hindu and he tells me that the food is halal, can I eat it? These things are related to amana. And when it comes to our religion, we should only trust those who are following our religion. A Hindu or a disbeliever usually would be interested only in making money. So if you go to a restaurant and you tell the customer, the, um, uh, the waiter or the owner of the, the restaurant, any question, he would say, yes, of course, regardless. So if you ask him, is this fish halal? He said, yes, it was slaughtered in a halal way, which shows you that he knows nothing. He just wants to sell. So it is best to not take their word for it, especially when it comes to your own integrity and your own religious commitment. If they have a certificate that is from the government and from the authorities 
to prove that it is halal or from the Islamic center, yes, you can uh, uh, accept that and take their word uh, for it. Finally, what is the ruling on coloring books? Can children col color living or non-living images as they are not yet accountable? The most authentic opinion is that even children, they are, even if they're not accountable, the parents are. So if a child wants to drink alcoholic beverages, wine or champagne, or wants to smoke, or wants to listen to music, or wants to do something haram. Though the child is not accountable, we as parents are. And this leads us to the fact that coloring, drawing books, is part of drawing it. So it is not at all permissible for children to be assisted in doing such a thing. They'll grow up loving and liking uh, uh, such things and most likely would influence them in the future and hence we must uh, stop them from doing this. When the coloring books are related to drawings of animals, humans, birds, living creatures. But if it's coloring books of landscape, of uh, greenery, of uh, mountains, of whatever farms, there is no problem in that inshallah. So we'll take your questions, then we'll answer them at the end, bi'idnillah. Muhammad from the Philippines. Muhammad. Hello. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. This is not Muhammad. Uh, 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 sorry, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Who's this? It's Muhammad from the USA. Ah, oh, Muhammad from the US. Yes, Muhammad. What can I do for you? Um, uh, if a brother was uh, in the United States Army and then repented, but he um, lied to them about uh, um, what he was uh, about, like a disability, so he can uh, get uh, money from them. Would that money be halal because they're kuffar harbi, and so their uh, money and wealth is halal for us? Or um, uh, would that be haram because he's lying to them about this disability that he doesn't have? Okay, I will answer, inshallah. Farooq from Qatar. Kim? Farooq? So, yes, can you, can you hear me? Yes, Yahi. Okay, so my question is, if I do Tawriya, while it seems to be like I am lying, then would I be sinful? For example, if I bring my phone to school and my friends know about this, but then a teacher asks me if I brought my phone to school and I say I don't have my phone and raise my hands to like show they're empty while intending with those words that I don't have my phone on my body, but it's in my back. So my friends like, it, it like kind of seems to them that I'm lying. Okay, I will answer inshallah. Akbar from India. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, in one of your lectures, you were saying about the people under the shade of Arsh on the Day of Judgment. One of them is the one who doesn't go to pious people and ask them to make dua for him, if I am not wrong. You are wrong. Include... You are wrong. You're mixing two hadith together. But yes, go ahead. Does it include asking parents to make dua for us or asking someone to make dua after helping them, etc.? Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Uh, Ahnaf from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, could you please like briefly explain the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam was asked to, to teach an act which would keep, like enter one into paradise and keep one away from hell? And then what did he say? Uh, I cannot recall the hadith <laughs> I, can, I, I can't remember either, Akhi. So <laughs> don't test my memory. I'm over 60. <laughs> oh, okay, just try try to find the hadith and come back to me, inshallah. Wujazak. Uh, Tanha from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. 
Uh, one or two months ago, I call you. I say that me and my husband fornicate before marriage. I say that we repent and we stop fornication. I also got my period, but we still talk to each other. You say that as long as we repent and we stop fornication, our marriage is valid. But for uh, communicating, we are sinful. Now I have a doubt and I need a help. Uh, on that time, we realized that this is a sin and we don't want to end up in the hell. Uh, we want to stop this sin, but we are so weak. So we decided to get married. We think that marriage can help us to stop this sin. We saw fornication three or four months before marriage, but we are still dating and don't stop seeing each other. Uh, though we stop fornication physically, but we talk about intercourse uh, since it was long time ago i just can remember we asked allah to help us to leave this sin before marriage but don't want to do this sin any uh, because we don't want to do this sin anymore but we don't ask allah to forgive us uh, the remorse we are feeling now and how we ask allah to forgive us now on that time we just say help us to leave this sin we don't want to do this before marriage. And yes. we don't want to end up in hell. But don't feel the remorse as we are feeling now. Now I don't know our marriage is valid or not. So basically, basically you want to divorce your husband? No, I don't. Then why are you coming up with this nonsense? You've repented. You've stopped fornication for four months. And still you are thinking... That is my marriage valid or not? Do you want me to say it's not valid? You have to leave him? No, I don't. Then stop. And don't ask ever about this issue. You will one day fall in the hands of a mufti who will say, <gasps> you're living in ghunna, you're living in zina, you can't be with him. All of your children are born out of the wedlock. Would you like this? No. I answered you before. Why are you doing this again and again? Are you enjoying torturing yourself and your husband and your family? No. Then stop. Your marriage is valid. Understood? Yeah. Thank you. Sabira from India. Shantullah. Uh, how much amount of blood is considered as spotting before menses? And uh, how, how much blood? How much blood is considered? As spotting before menses. Okay. I will answer, inshallah. Uh, Amatullah from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Alaikum assalam, Allah. My question is Is following or for customs that don't go against Islam necessary? If you fear people will humiliate you, and are you sinful if you don't follow the customs and bear the humiliation? Give example. Like uh, in my country, um, people don't like women to marry a uh, younger men than themselves. So. If they uh, marry younger, then is it haram for them? Okay, I will answer, inshallah. Fahim from Bangladesh. Sheikh, Assalamualaikum. Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, my question is on the topic of uh, drawing image. So, uh, to give an example, if I draw a hand, uh, my hand, and I put an eye on the palm of my hand, is that uh, mimic, mimicking the creation, creation of Allah? So is that drawing haram? So now anyone looks at your hand that you had drawn would think that this has a life because it has, an, has eyes on it. Okay. Okay, okay got it? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay. And we have uh, Arabi from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. It is hard to get you nowadays. I'm uh, very ha uh, hot commodity nowadays. <laughs> sir, I have, uh, sir, I have three questions. Very one, important, but one only. Uh, sir, I will ask two. 
please. <laughs> no bargaining on the Ask Zad. You have only one. We have so many people trying to get uh, a hold of this uh, pr program. So Hello. please. For you. Yeah, sir. Uh, my question is, I get Wiswas, but I say, Audu Billahi Minash Shaitwani Rajim. Still, I get it. So is it my nafs that is creating it? And another question was, uh, Sheikh, that burning, Qur burning Quranic verse and uh, inhaling the smoke, is it any kind of rupiah? This is my two questions, Sheikh. Okay, Faizan from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu wa rahmatullah. Ahsan Allah wa alaikum. Wa alaikum. Uh, so, Sheikh, in my school we have weekly tests, and sometimes I get really good grades in it with the grace of Allah. I have some non Muslim classmates who keep on asking me my marks. So, they get amazed, uh, but they don't say, MashaAllah, Allahumma barik. So I feel attracting evil eyes. So should I tell them my marks or should I hide them? And also I observe my daily askar, alhamdulillah. Okay, I will answer inshallah. Uh, Aisha from Tajikistan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, my question is regarding women's prayer. Uh, first one is in standing position. Should a woman put uh, both of her legs together so that there is no space between them, uh, as it's said in Hanafi school of thought? Or can she uh, just stay like men uh, with uh, some space between two legs? Also, while doing ruku, they say women should bend their legs a bit. And, and I would like to know what's the ruling for this. And, and the last one is regarding the sitting position. Is a women's way of sitting the same or uh, different compared to men's way of sitting in tashahud? Jazakallah khairan. What jazakum? Fuad from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. So, Sheikh, if a person enters the masjid and finds that the congregation has ended and there is no one to perform the second congregation, therefore, can he start the second congregation with someone from among the participants of the first congregation because there was no one to perform the second congregation with that person? Barakallah fikum. Wa fikum barakallah. Abdullah from Iran. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I want consolation on an issue that's been, uh, I've, I've been overthinking for the past few days. Uh, I've been uh, accepted in, in a university that it is in a town three or four hours away from our hometown. And, you know, my university is in a town which is uh, from a Shia region in Iran, and it's the one of the biggest centers of Shia. There's absolutely no Sunni masjid, no population, no center, nothing. So the last semester I spent in university, and I prayed jama'ah only once, and that was the opportunity that I could lead uh, one of the Shia roommates in prayer. So, you know, I feel my heart uh, gets hard in that uh, situation. Also, you know, living with corrupt roommates in hostels, uh, you know, getting attracted to girls when you're alone and far from family. So that's a question, uh, uh, that's an issue and a problem that I have. Our hometown, which Alhamdulillah is from the Sunni region of Iran, we have many, many, many Sunni masjids. I can pray five times a day easily. We have a uh, open university, which, uh, you know, uh, the degree of this uh, university of our town has less value compared to the government universities. Uh, but, uh, you know, when I think of it, I, you know, here I have better atmosphere around with people uh, of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. I can pray five times a day. So I thought that, is it advisable for me to, uh, you know, quit my current university from the Shia town and move to this university here? I will answer you, inshallah, Abdullah. Uh, Nasra from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu Um. So... I know we're supposed to be using um, Umm al-Qura timetable um, for the first four prayers because Aisha is wrong. Um, so my question is, there's a masjid um, in my city. It's pretty close um, to my house. And they post their five daily prayers on their website um, from Fajr to Aisha. So I was just wondering, like, can I use the first four um, prayers off of Umm al-Qura and then use Isha off of the website? Or is there like another timetable that I can use? Okay, I will answer inshallah. And we have Rozwan from Bangladesh. Rizwan. Rizwan. 
We have a Suwaidiq from the UK. Naam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Naam, I hope you're doing well. Uh, my question is, uh, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala misguide his servant? And uh, I would like to know the the statement, وَمَنْ يُدْلِ فَلَا حَادِيَ لَا Does the translation, the meaning of it, does it, whoever Allah leave him astray, you cannot get anyone to guide him, or uh, whoever Allah misguide him, uh, you cannot find anyone to guide them. Okay. Jazakallah. What is that? Hamim from India. Hamim? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam, wa barakatuh. Um, I don't have actually a question, but I want some suggestion like how can a person be steadfast uh, on his deen? Because what happens with me sometimes, I am I want to worship a lot and I pray five times a day and do all the good deeds. But then after that, three or four days, suddenly I start sinning. It may be like listening to music, watching movies and all that. Then I leave my uh, salah. Then I uh, come in depression and again I go to Salah and uh, this cycle keeps on re repeating. It's like three or five years. I want something but to do like... I, I will answer you, Shah. I will answer you. Uh, Kasumba from Uganda. Kasumba? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam to Allah. Yes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam to Allah wa barakatuh. Yes, Akhi. Now today, we are in great confusion. Everyone comes out and, wants, uh, and he wants to give a fatwa. Sheikh, who is qualified to give a fatwa? What to make? Uh, and uh, Okay, I will answer inshallah. And uh, I think we will take the answers now. Do we have a, a, a break or shall we move on? Uh, okay, I don't think we have a break. Muhammad from the US says, I was in the US Army and I felt that I was doing something haram because of joining such an army. So I lied to them, showed them reports of disability so that they would give me honorable discharge due to my disability and I will take benefits from the veteran, whatever they call it. Is this halal? <laughs> of course not. Yeah, and you can't fix a mistake with another mistake. Two wrongs never make a right. So if you discovered that being in such an army goes against your ethics, your religious commitment, and you cannot be there, you cannot bail out by lying. No, in addition to that, you make money out of it. This is lying and cheating. Muslim Zakhi don't lie nor cheat. Farooq from Qatar says, is camouflaging the truth considered to be lying? This is known in Arabic as at-ta'rid or at-tawriyah. So if someone says to me, Akhi, do you have 10 euros? And I said, Wallahi, I don't have a dime. And I don't truly have dimes, I have dollars. So am I lying? No, this is not considered to be lying. It is camouflaging the truth. And it is one of the ways of avoiding lying. So if the, the teacher says, do you have a phone with you? And he said, no, look, I don't have any phones, but you have it in your pocket. This is not lying because you're showing your hands and it's best not to do it, but if you're gonna get into trouble, then this is permissible to do, inshallah. Akbar from India says that he heard in one of my lectures and he got this confusion. 
There is a lecture of mine where I explain the hadith seven are underneath the shade of Allah Azza wa Jal on the day of judgment. And he's saying that one of them is those who do not ask others to perform ruqya. And this is not true. That's another hadith where the Prophet told us alayhi salatu wasalam, about 70,000s of his ummah that would enter paradise without any accountability or being tormented. And one of them is those who do not ask others for ruqya. So we got this point clarified, inshallah. His question is, if I go to someone and say, Akhi, make dua for me. Tomorrow I have an exam. Or make dua that Allah pays off my debt. Would that exclude me from the 70,000? The answer is no, because the, those who are excluded are those who ask for ruqya. If I have jinn possession, black magic, envy, or evil eye, or if I have an illness, a sickness, I'm f uh, suffering pain, and I ask someone to do ruqya on me to relieve me from my pains, then this would exclude me. Asking people for dua is totally permissible. Tanha from Pakistan, we've addressed this issue, and I have this hundreds of times a month. Women coming over and over and over, doubting whether the marriage is valid or not. Men doubting their marriage is valid or not. They repeat the marriage, and they repeat it a third time, and a fourth time, and they keep on insisting that Maybe it's not valid. Maybe we are living in zina, we're living in haram. All of these are whispers from shaitan. The sad part is that they keep on knocking on the same door. And if the sheikh tells them, your marriage is valid, there's nothing wrong in it, they go to another sheikh. Until they reach one sheikh would say, no, your marriage is invalid. You're living in haram. Your children are born out of wedlock. Now they go back to sheikh number one. They knock on the door. Sheikh, we're sorry, but I know you gave us fatwa 600 times before. Now this sheikh says our marriage is invalid. So what's your take on that? Then you will be in trouble because most likely the first sheikh would say, I have nothing to do with you. Yeah, but Sheikh, please help us. We will do whatever you want. No, no can do. You've exhausted your lives in the game. Now it's game over. This is what you get when you keep on insisting and opening this can of worms. If you open it, you'll get only worms. And they will disturb your life. You're insisting it for it because shaitan is overtaking your mind and messing up with your head big time. You get what you deserve. The sheikh told you and gave you the fatwa. Your marriage is valid. It's in, on him. Move on with your life. No, 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 no. I just want to destroy my marriage. I want to get a divorce. And then they said, no, no, no. We don't want to get a divorce. So they start crying. Such people need shock therapy, slap on the face, metaphorically, because slapping the face is haram, to wake them up and to see the gravity of what they're doing while they're in the process of destroying their own marriages. Sabra from India. She says, what is the quantity of spotting that would be considered menses? This is a frequently asked question by a lot of women. Before they get their monthly period, they get two to three days of brownish discharge, accompanied with cramps and back pain. Sometimes they may see a drop or two of blood. Scholars say this is istihada. This is not your monthly period. Disregard. And whenever the adhan is called, go to the toilet if you want to pray. Clean yourself, change your panties or, or, or underwear, make wudu and go and pray. Even if it continues to come, there's no problem in that. Now, 
When is it considered to be menses? When the blood starts to flow. And the flow of blood is well known and recognized uh, to women. It's not how many drops. It's the flow of blood that comes. This is when you stop praying and fasting. Amatullah. Uh, she says that urf. What is the meaning of urf? Urf is what people acknowledge to be the norm. So urf in some countries is when someone comes in, everybody stands up to shake hands. This is urf. Urf is that people may not speak while eating, de depending on the customs. Urf is when a person proposes to a girl, he has to be accompanied by his father and his family, most likely, his, his uncles, his siblings, to make it presentable, not coming on his own. This is official. So these are part of the customs, of the traditions, of the norm. So, um, uh, Amatullah is saying, is going against such norms would be sinful? Now, such genetic questions can be answered. We have to have an example so that we can understand and answer upon or answer that example. But this does not cascade to all other issues in your head. So she says, in our community, marrying someone, marrying a man who's younger than you is not something nice and people would consider it to be insulting. The answer to that would be, this is bogus. Such tradition and customs and urf is to be neglected and not to looked upon. Simply because the Prophet ﷺ married a woman who was older than him. So if the Prophet did this والسلام, and he's the role model, then definitely we can do that. So the age difference, whether the man is older than the girl or the girl is older than the man, there is nothing wrong or humiliating in this in Islam at all. We have a short break. Stay tuned. And inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught them what to say when stricken with a calamity. Allah says, what means? And we will surely test you with something of fear and hunger and a loss of wealth and lives and fruits. But give good tidings to the patient who when disaster strikes them, say indeed we belong to Allah and indeed to him we will return. Those are the ones upon whom are blessings from their Lord and mercy. And it is those who are the rightly guided. Um Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, said, I heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, There is not a Muslim that is afflicted with a calamity who says what Allah ordered him, what Allah ordered them to say. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Allahumma ajurni fi musibati wa khlufli khayran minha. To Allah we belong and unto him we shall return. O oh Allah, grant me reward in my calamity and give me something better in return. Accept that Allah will give him something better in return. Um Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, continued. When Abu Salama died, I said, which Muslim is better than Abu Salama? The first household to migrate to the Messenger of Allah. Then I said, that supplication. And Allah the Almighty gave me the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in return. Reported by Muslim.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Arabi from Bangladesh says he often gets this wiswas. What's wiswas? It's whispers of shaitan. And he seeks frequently refuge in Allah Azza wa Jal. Sometimes it goes, sometimes it doesn't. So how does he know whether this is from shaitan or from himself? It doesn't matter. It's the same. So the end result is the same. And usually there is a huge collaboration between the two. Maybe Satan does this on his own. Maybe some, sometimes Satan collaborates with your own soul and self where you have your own whims and desires and he mixes both together. So it doesn't make any difference. Just seek, continue to seek refuge in Allah Azza wa from these whispers and try to remain steadfast. Uh, Faizan from India says, I do well with the, great of Allah, with the grace of Allah in exams, and sometimes non-Muslims ask me about my results. So I am hesitant to tell them for the fear of their evil eye, bearing in mind that I observe my adhkar in the morning, in the evening, after fard salat, before going to bed, and before leaving the house. If this is the case, Faizan, you have nothing to worry about. If they ask you, you can tell them, this is, oh, these are my grades, and feel confident that Allah Azza wa will protect you and that they are, or they will not be able to harm you the least. Uh, Aisha from Tajikistan, she says, the Hanafi scholars in my country make life difficult. So they say that women should not pray like men. First of all, we advise such scholars and students of knowledge to lower their gaze and not to look at women. How do you know that they're not praying properly? By you're looking at them. So lower your gaze and don't look at them. Secondly, the Prophet ﷺ had his female companions praying in the masjid with him and the other male companions, yet they were at the back of the masjid as far as possible, yet there were no barriers between men and women like we do have today. This meant that men coming late could easily see women offering prayer, standing in prayer. Never ever the Prophet ﷺ had instructed women to pull their legs together when standing up and not to stand normally like men or like normal people. He never told them to cave in themselves when doing ruku' or sujood or to sit in a particular way in tashahud. Rather, he said, pray, and this is for men and women, as you've seen me pray. Therefore, to come and claim. Well, the Prophet ﷺ did not teach the women how to pray properly and to conceal themselves. But this doesn't mean that we shouldn't do this. That is a bit outrageous. A Muslim should not have the audacity to come and say and claim that I know more than the Prophet or the companions. I'll teach women how to pray, which the Prophet fell short from doing. Billah. Are you accusing the Prophet of not knowing? Or are you accusing the Prophet with holding information and not delivering to uh, the Muslims? Either one is blasphemous. So, I know that they have good intention. Good intention is not always recommended or approved. The son of Abdullah ibn Umar, and I believe his name was Bilal, once heard his father narrating a hadith. And his father said, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, do not prevent women from attending the prayers in the masjid. Bilal, out of jealousy, 
being a hot-blooded Muslim, said, we will prevent them from attending the masjid because he, he had seen the abuse that some women made when they went to the masjid wearing uh, uh, flirtious clothes and putting perfumes and defying the other instruction of, of the Prophet ﷺ. So he said this out of what he thought of as a goodwill gesture to protect women folk, to protect the society, not realizing that he's objecting and defying the instruction of the Prophet ﷺ. And this, there's no justification for that. No matter how good intention you had. Abdullah ibn Umar, when he heard this objection and defiance from his son to the instruction of the Prophet ﷺ not to prevent them, he cursed him and said bad things to him. The narrator of the hadith said, I've never heard Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, ever speak such words. And he kept on yelling at his son, I'm telling you, the Prophet says something, and you say, no, we will do against it? Go and leave, for wallahi, I will never speak to you again. And Abdullah stood at his words and never spoke to his son, despite the numerous times of him coming to seek forgiveness and apologize until Abdullah died and he would not speak to his son. So when we come to these scholars and what they have come up with, with their good intention, we may yani, say, okay, may Allah reward you, but this is inapplicable in Islam. We follow the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the three favorite generations and what you're bringing, it does not fall under any of those, and Allah knows best. Fuad from Bangladesh says, if I come to a masjid and the prayer and the congregation is already over, is it permissible if I don't find a second congregation to call upon one of those who had already prayed to pray with me a second congregation? The answer is yes. This is proven from the authentic hadith where the Prophet ﷺ once prayed Fajr congregation with the companions and after they concluded the prayer, a loner companion came in, but there was no one else to pray with him. So the Prophet addressed ﷺ the congregation who had just finished praying and said, who would give charity to this man? Meaning who would go and pray with him so that both they would have a congregation. Bearing in mind that they've just prayed Fajr, which means that it is time of restricting voluntary prayers. But this is exempted because it has a reason. So one of the companions went and offered the prayer with him. Abdullah from Iran, his question is disheartening to know that Muslims specifically Sunnis, and when we say Muslims, we mean Sunnis because they are the vast majority of Muslims, can pray anywhere in this world. I think even in the Vatican, maybe you'll find a, a prayer hall in there, maybe, I don't know. But when you come to a so-called Muslim country like Iran, you will not find a masjid for them. You will not find a place to pray Jumu'ah for them. If you go to the capital of Iran, you will not find a place for the Sunnis to pray, except if you go to the embassies. So if you go to the uh, Saudi embassy or to the Kuwaiti or the Qatari embassy, you will be able to pray Jumu'ah there. But this is unheard of. It's very sad. However, Abdullah says there are two options to study in a different city four hours away, which is dominated by Shia, not a single masjid as usual, 
and there is a lot of fitna. And I feel my heart is being uh, uh, hard, is becoming hard and stiff, and my iman is decreasing rapidly. Or I can stay in my hometown, which is dominated by Sunnah, with the grace of Allah, and we can pray in, with the Jama'ah and congregation according to Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. But the quality of teaching, the academia, and the university is lower. Akhi, nothing can compromise your Iman. No wealth, no higher education, nothing. Your Iman, your Islam comes first over everything. So in a heartbeat, take your decision and go back to your hometown, be among your jama'ah, pray like the Muslims pray, and uh, uh, be away from fitna, and inshallah, Allah will compensate you for the lack of quality in that university. Nasra, she says that the masjid close by to her home post on their website their prayer times. So she's asking, is it permissible for me to follow Umm al-Qura for Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, and Maghrib? When it comes to Isha, I follow this masjid? The answer is yes. There's no problem in that because most likely they are following the uh, um, University of Karachi in Pakistan, which their timing is most likely to be accurate for Isha. Um, a Suwaydiq from the UK, is it true that Allah lets astray whomever he wishes? The answer is of course. This is totally true and it is in black and white in the Quran, it's mentioned in the Sunnah, in numerous places. مَنْ يَهْدِي اللَّهُ فَهُوَ الْمُهْتَدْ Whomever Allah guides is the guided one. وَمَنْ يُضْلِلْ فَلَنْ تَجِدَ لَهُ وَلِيًّا مُرْشِدًا And whoever Allah misguides, no one will guide or be an ally to. So this is part of Allah being the Lord of this universe. Everything in this universe belongs to who? Allah. Who's the creator? Allah. Who provides for every creature and living being in this universe? Allah. Who facilitates the affairs? Allah. Who gives life and death? Allah. So who dares question Allah Azza wa Jal for what he does? Yes, Sheikh, but how is it possible that Allah misguides people? Does Allah own us? Yes. If he throws us in hell, can anybody complain or object? No. If I take a hundred dollar bill and burn it, can anybody say, whoa, stop, don't do that? No, it's mine. So Allah has the highest example. But you don't mix apples with oranges. Before you jump to conclusions, ask yourself the following questions. Does Allah own everything in this universe? The answer is yes. Is Allah knowledgeable? The answer is yes. Is Allah wise? The answer is yes. Is Allah fair and just and never transgresses against anyone? The answer is definitely yes. If you have this given and if you have your conviction set on this, then you know that when Allah sets someone astray, that Allah Azza wa Jal did not do anything wrong or unfair or unjust. Because Allah is acting within his dominion. And Allah Azza wa Jal is acting within his wisdom and knowledge and fairness and justice. So this is your mistake. And this is your own wrongdoing. If you want to be guided, this is the way. Welcome. Our hands are open. You're the one who doesn't want to. So who are you to blame? Allah mentioned in Surah Ibrahim, chapter 14, verse number 22, that Satan, when the people of hell come and complain, start blaming him, it's because of you that we are 
in hellfire for eternity. He stands up and give an oration, gives a speech. Allah, he says, it's in the Quran, check it out, 1422. Allah promised you and fulfilled his promise. I promised you and betrayed you. I had no power over you except to call you and you responded and answered. So don't blame me, rather blame yourselves. I'm not going to benefit you and you're not going to benefit me. This is what's will, what will happen. So it's your own shortcoming and mistake. Hameem from India. How can we remain steadfast on religion and increase our Iman? Because I pray five times a day, yet after a few days, I start neglecting few prayers and I start to commit few sins and my Iman plunges down. So what am I going to do? What can I do? Akhi, this requires a lecture. And on my YouTube channel, you'll find a number of links to tell you how to increase your Iman and to remain steadfast. But basically, the best thing to make you remain steadfast is reciting the Quran. This is how the Prophet Islam remained steadfast by reciting the Quran. Recite the Quran for one hour a day, daily, without any interruption. And you will see the improvement in your lifestyle and the quality of living. Associate yourself with practicing righteous Muslim 24-7. Stop all means that facilitate sin. Social media, cut it all. Stop watching it all. The media, Netflix, movies, series, songs. Cut it all. Lower your gaze. Don't free mix. And you will find that your Iman skyrockets with the grace of Allah. Finally, Kasumba from Uganda. Who is qualified for fatwa and for ishtihad? The answer is those who are rendered and considered to be scholars. A scholar is someone who is acknowledged by other scholars to be a scholar. They know that this person is consistent, is knowledgeable, doesn't flip sides. He has knowledge of the Arabic language fluently and the sciences. He has knowledge of the Quran and the sciences of the Quran, things that are abrogated and not. The Asbab al Nuzul, al Nasikh wal Mansukh. He has knowledge of the Tafsir. He has knowledge of the authentic Sunnah and what is not authentic and the meaning of it and when what is, was said, what the scholars said. He has knowledge of the usul al-fiqh, the fundamentals of fiqh. And he has knowledge of fiqh itself and where it was stemmed from and the evidences that back it and the different opinion of scholars. And above all, he has to be righteous, God-fearing, and someone you can trust his moral conduct. This is a person who is qualified for fatwa and ishtihad, and Allah Azza wa knows best. This is all the time we have until we meet tomorrow, inshallah, Sunday at 4.15 Mecca time. I leave you for Imanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين